Well, you can open up your Bibles to 1 Samuel 23 and Psalm 31. Sweet Spirit of Christ Jesus, we come before you, our Savior and our God, and we again just acknowledge your great grace and your love for us. And we pray that you would speak to us as you have spoken to people since the beginning of time, and that you would give us ears to hear, unclog the ears of our hearts, Father, that we might truly hear you. Father, I pray that you would exhort those who need exhortation and encourage those who need to be encouraged and comfort those who are needing comfort, Father. And that your word tonight would just wash over us. I pray, Father, as we study these things, that we would do more than study, that our emotions would get caught up and that we would worship even as we are in the word. And we seek your spirit to do this in and among us and to lead us now and be our teacher in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll start in 1 Samuel 23. It's a time not of joy. We studied that on Sunday morning, Psalm 30, the psalm of joy, joy in the morning. Well, it's not a time of joy that is the background or the basis for this psalm. It's a time of conspiracy. It's a time when David was not on the throne, but on the run, trying to stay protected from Saul. He's living that desperado's life in the desert of the lowlands of Judah. Some 600 misfits and miscreants and malcontents had gathered themselves to David in this place, hiding out there, cast offs from Saul's kingdom. Those who would turn out to be, for the most part, great men, great fighters. David's mighty men would be formed from from these misfits. But it wasn't just the 600 men, it was the 600 men and all of their families and their children, and they just began to trail down to David where he was. And they had finally made somewhat of a home for themselves there in the southern deserts, away from Saul's gaze, away from the danger. And as they're living down there, verse 1 of 1 Samuel 23 says, Then they told David saying, Behold, the Philistines are fighting against Keilah and are plundering the threshing floors. Keilah, that's a town that was there southwest of Jerusalem in those farmlands of Judah. It's just outside Philistine territory, which if you want a point of reference, is the Gaza Strip today. That was originally the land of the Philistines. And the proximity of Keilah, along with the propensity of the Philistines made this city a prime target for attack. Kind of like Ashdod of today. You know, it's a prime target of, of attack by Hamas out of the Gaza Strip. Well, the Philistines, they would come out of their, of their little hole there, and they would attack. They were scavengers in many ways. They, they attacked what they felt was weak, and they stole what they, what they could get. So they went into these farmlands, and they would take the wheat right off the threshing floor in the night, and if there was any resistance, they would put up a fight. And so for the town of Keilah, the times were hard, uh, difficult economically, because their very livelihood was being stolen out from under them. Terror was a constant. They never knew when the next attack was going to come. And the people of Keilah, they need a deliverer. Word comes to David, this is what's going on. Now, something to understand, Keilah means fortress or citadel. It was named that because in this location were two large rocky outcroppings, like small mountains of rock. And in between these two rocks, these great stones, they built the gate entrance to the city as a stronghold against attack, as a fortress, as it were, that the people could live in. They felt they would be safe there, but you're not safe when your livelihood, when your, when your food is being ripped off from you. And so this stronghold, this fortress, this citadel of Keilah is being attacked by the Philistines who have found a way to be a menace to the people there. Verse 2 goes on and says, So David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go and attack these Philistines? And the Lord said to David, Go and attack the Philistines and deliver Keilah. But David's men said to him, 
behold, we're afraid here in Judah. How much more then if we go to Kelilah against the ranks of the Philistines? And then David inquired of the Lord once more. And the Lord answered him and said, Arise, go down to Keilah, for I will give the Philistines into your hands. Now, I love what David does here. It it shows us more of his heart. It's, It's who he was. David begins, as he hears about this problem, this trouble these people are having, he immediately takes it to the Lord. That's his first move. Take it to the Lord. In fact, I'll tell you what, you could call this a spiritual sandwich, a very healthy sandwich. Because David first takes it to the Lord, and then he tests it with his men, and then he takes it back to the Lord. And that is always a healthy way to approach life, spiritually speaking. Take it to the Lord, test it with people. Proverbs 15.22 says, Without consultation, plans are frustrated. But with many counselors, they succeed. And that's what David has around him. He has his men, his counselors. He's already prayed. The Lord says, go. And he says, what are you guys hearing? What do you think? Should we do this? And then after his men respond, he goes back to the Lord a second time and tests it again, takes it to the Lord again. This is the mark of a great spiritual leader. One who prays first, seeks counsel of godly people around him, and then prays a second time. Because, you know, the counsel you get may not be the same as what the Lord tells you to do, which is exactly the case here. David goes to the Lord and God says, fight. He goes to his men and they say, flee. And he goes back to the Lord and the Lord says, no, I said, fight. David is seeking the Lord and he's sensitive to his followers. He has asked to make them trust their leader who would come to them and, and say, what do you guys think? But then he seeks the Lord again. And that is the key to sound spiritual decision making. And oftentimes what we will do is we will seek the Lord. We'll get the first two thirds of the sandwich right. We'll seek the Lord, and then we'll, we'll go and seek counsel, but we don't take it back to the Lord. And it's like, have you ever tried to eat a sandwich where you got the bread, you got the meat, but you're out of bread? So you're going to have one piece. It's very frustrating. Especially if it's peanut butter and jelly. It doesn't work real well. Well, David goes back, and that's key. Because, listen, his men give different counsel. And this is where we get into trouble. Oh, I prayed about it, but then I went and saw my Christian friends, and, well, then I went this direction. Well, our mistake is not going back to the Lord and retesting what we've heard. And this is what David does. And he was good to do it because his men are right, but they're wrong. What do you mean by that? Well, they're they're correct in their assessment of the situation. Here's David, his 600 men. They're hiding out in Judah. They're in a quiet, finally a little peace. And notice what they say here in verse 3. Behold, we were, we are afraid here in Judah. We're hiding out. We're afraid of Saul and his armies. We finally have a place here. And he said, how much more then if we go to Keilah against the ranks of the Philistines? They're not afraid of the Philistines, gang. They're afraid that if they fight the Philistines, it's going to draw attention to their presence there in southern Judah. Saul's going to hear about it and come after them. And by the way, that's exactly what happens. His men were right. We don't want to raise a ruckus, David. We don't want to draw attention to ourselves. They're right. But though they're right in their assessment, they are wrong in their decision. They are wrong in their answer. They make a human calculation of what will take place. They're correct about that. But the spiritual calculation is what's missing. And that's why it's great that David goes back to the Lord because the Lord says, No, I understand this, but you go fight and rescue these people. Interesting. The fear is the amount of dust that's going to be stirred up. Attracting Saul. Human counsel is of some value. The Proverbs 15.22 again tells us that. Seek the counsel. Many, many counselors. There's wisdom in that. But it's always the most nutritious when sandwiched between godly counsel. 1 Corinthians 2.12. Paul says, We have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may know all things freely given to us by those who counsel us. No, that's a misquote. That we may freely know all things given to us by God. This is one of the reasons we love David so much. He's always seeking the Lord's will before, in the middle, and after. He's taking it to the Lord. And there's a difference there, and we see it here. The difference between human wisdom and spiritual wisdom. Take it to the Lord. Test it with other believers. Take it back to the Lord. 
So what happens? Verse 5, David and his men went to Keilah, and they fought with the Philistines, and he led away their livestock. He struck them with a great slaughter. Thus David delivered the inhabitants of Keilah. God knew they would. He knew the outcome. He knew it had to be done. He also knew, as I just said, that the slaughter would raise the attention of Saul. God knew that. Didn't catch him off guard. He didn't think, well, get in there, fight him. Maybe if you get out quick enough, Saul won't know. No, Saul is going to know. God knows Saul is going to know and become a threat to David's desert sanctuary. Why would God do that? Hold that thought. Verse 6. Now it came about when Abiatar, the son of Ahimelech, fled to David at Keilah, that he came down with an ephod in his hand. It's the ephod of the, of the high priest. And when it was told to Saul that David had come to Keilah, Saul said, God has delivered him into my hand. For he shut himself in by entering a city with double gates and bars, that fortress, that citadel. You can't duck out the back or out the sides. You've got to go right out the front gate. And Saul's thinking, I'll just get down there, block the front gate, and we've got David, finally. Well... Saul summoned all the people for war to go down to Keilah to besiege David and his men. Now, David knew that Saul was plotting evil against him. So he said to Abiatar the priest, bring the ephod here. And then David said, O Lord God of Israel, your servant has heard for certain that that Saul is seeking to come to Keilah to destroy the city on my account. Will the men of Keilah surrender me into his hand? Will Saul come down just as your servant has heard? O Lord God of Israel, I pray, tell your servant. And the Lord said, he will come down. You got it right, David. He's on his way. And when David said, well, will the men of Keilah surrender me and my men into the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, they will surrender you. What? Are you kidding me? David just saved them from the Philistines. He just wiped out their biggest problem. He caused the terror to cease. He saved their economy. David comes in. He is the savior of the day. But the people are going to betray him. Unbelievable. And then David and his men, about 600, arose and departed from Keilah, and they went wherever they could go. And when it was told Saul that David had escaped from Keilah, he gave up the pursuit. David stayed in the wilderness and the strongholds and remained in the hill country in the wilderness of Ziph. And Saul sought him every day, but God did not deliver him into his hand. Now, listen, verse 11 and 12 are what you could call the Reader's Digest version of Psalm 31. Let me read them to you again. Verse 11, will the men of Keilah surrender me into his hand? Will Saul come down just as your servant has heard? O Lord God of Israel, I pray, tell your servant. And the Lord said he will come down. David said, will the men of Keilah surrender me and my men into the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, they will surrender you. So this short prayer that we get two verses of here in 1 Samuel 23, I believe is is fleshed out in Psalm 31. That that's the location. That is David's writing of that psalm. It's based on this incident right here. The astounding backdrop of Psalm 31 is not only the threat of Saul, and you need to get this into your thinking before we get to the psalm, it's also the treachery of the very people David risked his life to save. Therefore, Psalm 31 is the psalm of betrayal. If you want to have a heading for it, that's a good heading for Psalm 31, the psalm of betrayal. You ever felt betrayed by someone you went out of your way to help? I'm going to serve this person. I'm I'm going to go above and beyond for this person. I I really want to help this person. And the next thing you know, they turn around and and they bite you for it. They, They tear into you or they begin to slander you to others. They talk about what a terrible person you are. And all you're trying to do is help them out. Have you ever felt like throwing in the towel on human kindness? You ever have one of those days where you think, man, it's just not worth lending a hand? There are days we've all had them where we're like, man, why should I help people when they're just going to let me down? And by the way, they will. Feeling better tonight for coming? (laughs) They will let you down. And they will let you down in the church. Why? Because we're a bunch of sinners here. If you think going to another church is going to make it better, you better check yourself because you yourself is going to, you're going to make that church worse. You're going to be hurt when you reach out a hand to help somebody 
Let me encourage you. Do it anyway. Do it anyway. Well, why should I? <laughs> Before we even get to the psalm, notice there are two great results of David's obedience. Of David going to rescue this people. Result number one, verse five. David and his men went to Keilah and fought with the Philistines and he led away their livestock. Result number one, David led away the livestock. Cows, sheep, goats. God tells you to do something. Man, even if it goes against conventional wisdom, don't have a cow. The attack was an utter success. Livestock, cow, utter. You with me? (laughs) David really steered them in the right direction. He didn't want his men to be sheepish, but he never once tried to pull the wool over their eyes. Look at all this livestock. (laughs) He gets out of the situation. Seriously. Not only is there a great slaughter, but he pulls out all this livestock, so there's going to be milk and meat and wool and leather and provision for not only those 600 men, but all the families that are gathered there. God provides. Where did their food come from in the desert? What was their livelihood? God provides. David's obedient. God provides. David led away much livestock. There is always a good return. It may not look like what you're thinking, but there is always a good return for obedience, for just trusting the Lord. Jesus said in Luke 6.38, Give, and it will be given to you. Maybe not by those you give to, but it will be given to you. They'll pour into your lap a good measure, Jesus says, pressed down and shaken together and running over. For by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you in return. That's why you love people. That's why you help. Not for what you'll get from them, but because Jesus promises you, as you give, so it's going to be given. There will be a return. But did you catch it? There's another great lesson here. Number two, David lessened the strength of his enemy. By obeying God and going up against the Philistines, we're told that he struck them with a great slaughter. Listen, following the will of God over the will of man always weakens the enemy. That alone is a great reason to care, to serve. It weakens the enemy. Resistance to the enemy, it loosens his grip. It weakens his offensive. James says, James 4, 7, Submit therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. That is such a critical verse in spiritual warfare. If you will resist him, he'll flee. He'll run away. Why? Because why? the devil ultimately is a coward. Terrorists are. 1 Peter 5, 9, Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. Man, when you go up against the enemy, when you obey God and love people, it lessens the strength of the enemy. Step by step, skirmish by skirmish, prayer by prayer, we weaken the power of the enemy by the power of God, both in our lives and in the lives of other people as we serve. And it doesn't matter if they appreciate it or understand it, we lessen the strength of the enemy when we love each other and when we serve. By the way, betrayal, which the people of Keilah, they betray David. That kind of betrayal is usually rooted in cowardice. The people of Keilah, they were afraid of the Philistines. They weren't fighting back. They were just, no, you're taking our food, man. Well, fight, man. No, they were afraid. And then when David rescued them, why would they betray him? Because they were afraid of Saul and his army. You can almost see the little council of men there in the center of Keilah going, well, what do we do? We've got to tell Saul because he's going to come in and wipe us out. It's cowardice. And oftentimes, when someone betrays you or slanders you or gossips against you, it's cowardice. And people like that need deliverance. People like that need a rescuer. And so bring them Jesus in your service. That's the backdrop. On to the psalm. Psalm 31. David writes in verse 1, In you, O Lord, I have taken refuge. Let me never be ashamed. In your righteousness, deliver me. Incline your ear to me. Rescue me quickly. Be to me a rock of strength. A stronghold to save me, for you are my rock and my fortress. For your name's sake, you will lead me 
and you will guide me. A rock, a stronghold, a fortress. Keilah is David's word picture for this psalm. I can imagine David, you can see him, you can hear him thinking about that city, that stronghold, that, that citadel. And he begins to write and say, you know what? That's not the place of protection. The Lord is my fortress. But note this. Why does David say God will save him? Why should God save him? Verse 3, for your namesake. For your namesake. Why should God save any of us? Because we fought well? Because we somehow bested the enemy? Because we're faithful servants? No, that is not why God saves us. You know why He does. It's for His name's sake. Understand this. He saves me because He said He would save me and because my salvation reflects on His name. Psalm 23, verse 3. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Isaiah 48, 9. For the sake of my name I delay my wrath, and for my praise I restrain it for you, in order not to cut you off. Behold, I have refined you, but not as silver. I have tested you in the furnace of affliction for my own sake. And for my own sake I will act, and for how can my name be profaned, and my glory I will not give to another. Again and again we hear this principle throughout Scripture. It's God saying, for the sake of my name, that's why I'm doing this. Why does God grace us with salvation for His name's sake? First and foremost. And by the way, that's how I want to live. That's how I want to be found. To hear Him say, as He does in Revelation chapter 2, verse 3, You have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake. For the sake of my name. Not for your own salvation. You can't find it in Scripture. God saying, if you do these things, these things will buy you your place in heaven. No, He says, I will save you for the sake of My name. And so, that's how we're called to live. For the sake of His name and not for ourselves. Grace frees us from having to worry about living for myself, trying to prove myself, trying to save myself. Grace frees me from that. And gives me the freedom now to live simply for His glory. Simply for His name's sake. David says in Psalm 31, 4, You will pull me out of the net which they have secretly laid for me. For you are my strength. Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have ransomed me, O Lord, God of truth. Trust the Lord. If God is your strength, He can pull you back out of the worst betrayal. Someone slanders you. Someone's going against you behind your back. Someone's undermining you at work. Don't fight it. Don't worry about it. God knows. He can protect. He can save you. I don't know how many times over the years I have given this exact counsel to people. And how many times over the years I've needed this exact counsel myself. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in Him. And He will do it. Psalm 37 verse 5. Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy 1.12 I know whom I have believed. And I am convinced that He is able to guard what I've entrusted to Him until that day. It begins with you. Have you entrusted your life to the Lord? Have you given your life to Him? And beyond that, have you entrusted your valuables to the Lord? That is, your livelihood, your hopes, more tangibly, your children, family, friends. Have you entrusted these important things, these important people? Have you entrusted them to the Lord? Parents, and I'm talking to parents of fully grown, moved out, living on their own children, as well as parents of young children, please understand. They are in the hands of the Lord. Have you entrusted them to the Lord? Something, as I said last week, I'm just starting to learn to do. And do you believe God is capable of guarding that which you have entrusted to Him? This is what David is talking about. Verse 6, I hate those who regard vain idols. Who's he talking about there? Philistines. Idolatrous, pagan Philistines. But I trust in the Lord. I will rejoice and be glad in your loving kindness because you have seen my affliction. You have known the troubles of my soul. And you have not given me over into the hand of the enemy. You set my feet in a large place. I like that verse. You set my feet in a large place. I'm not holed up in the citadel. I'm not there in Keilah. I'm not in the fortress. No, I'm out in a large place. Where was this large place? 
Well, back in 1 Samuel 23, verse 14, it tells us David stayed in the wilderness in the strongholds and remained in the hill country in the wilderness of Ziph. And Saul sought him every day, but God did not deliver him into his hand. The large place that David went to with his men was the wilderness, the wilderness of Ziph. And the reason I tell you, it sounds kind of like a Dr. Seuss story, doesn't it? And then the people of Ziph. I can't even find a rhyme for Ziph. Rachel, work on that and get back to me, will you? Ziph means something, though. The wilderness of Ziph, this is where David is. He's out, he's out there in the wilderness. Ziph means battlement or refinement. He's in the wilderness of refinement. The large open place, this, this large place to which he runs. And there in the wilderness of refinement, David's trust in the Lord is refined daily as he learns to believe in and follow his God. Verse 9, he says, Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am in distress. My eye is wasted away from grief, my soul and my body also. For my life is spent with sorrow and my years with sighing. My strength has failed because of my iniquity. My body has wasted away, David says of himself, because of all my adversaries I've become a reproach, especially to my neighbors and an object of dread to my acquaintances. Those who see me in the street flee from me in his flesh David is tired of refinement. (laughs) He's tired of of being sanctified. Enough with the sanctification already, Lord. I'm so sanctified, people think I'm a weirdo. People talk about me behind my back. They see me in the street. They, They flee. They run away. He's tired of this embattled life and the fact that even his neighbors are afraid of him. What does that mean? David's neighbors are afraid of him. Well, it's the people of Israel. Saul's king. We can't go out there to David. David, who, remember, at 17, bested Goliath and saved Israel. David, who over the ensuing years would become such a mighty man that the people would say, Saul has killed his his thousands. David is tens of thousands. This was a hero of Israel. And then all this gets stripped away as Saul begins to chase him to the point now where all the talk of Israel is David's a scumbag. That's hard stuff. The glory days to the bottom of the pit out there in the desert and even my neighbors are afraid of me. Before David was a beloved king, he was a betrayed man, a slandered outlaw in Israel for years until the truth finally came out. And you know, we need to take a lesson from that. You may feel slandered for years before the truth comes out, but it will. It will. Stand with the Lord. Trust Him. The truth always comes out. He always brings truth to the fore. Believe Him. Verse 12. David says, I'm forgotten as a dead man out of mind. I'm like a broken vessel. For I have heard the slander of many. Terror is on every side. While they took counsel together against me, they schemed to take away my life. This is indicating those in Keilah who betrayed David to Saul. Someone got word out that David was there. And this was no conspiracy theory. This was reality for David. Verse 14. But as for me, I trust in you, O Lord. I say, you are my God. My times are in your hand. Great verse. Deliver me from the hand of my enemies and from those who persecute me. As far as I'm concerned, the most trusting thing a follower of Jesus Christ can say is, My times are in your hands. If we memorize that, think that verse through, repeat it daily, My times are in your hands. My times are in your hands, O Lord. Job had to learn that kind of trust. He didn't realize that, not at first. You recall we talked about this back when we were in Job, Job 24, verse 1. He said, why are times not stored up by the Almighty? And why do those who know Him not see His days? Hayden had an unlucky day this week, as he called it. uh, We got up at 2 o'clock in the morning, Tuesday morning. Because we had uh, standby tickets for him and his friend Isaac 
Isaac Burge, who lives in Colorado, and Hayden, for the first time in his life, is going to go to Colorado with his friend. He's been asking us for years. Two o'clock in the morning, we get up because the plane leaves at 5.30, and if you're flying standby, you've got to be there and hope you can get on. The earliest flight is the most likely, right? So we drive down to Seattle. We get there, 5.30. And the time to board comes and goes, and they don't call, and Hayden and Isaac don't get on. And you can just see Hayden. Oh. He's already been up since 2, so he's oh. bummed out. So we went and got some breakfast, and we sat down, and we played some cards together, and started having a little bit of fun. And then, and then we went for the 7.30 flight. And they called Isaac's name, and they didn't call Hayden. And I look at Hayden, she's like, I got up at 2 in the morning, I'm going to have to go home. You know, he's just bummed out. And Isaac's in line, and he's looking at Hayden, and Hayden's, and they call Hayden. Yes. I'm like, yes, get him out of here. <laughs> and so he gets on the plane and they take off and Hayden calls me later on. After he arrives in Colorado. And he sounds a little down. I'm like, what's wrong, Hayden? You made it. You're in Colorado. Yeah, it's just been an unlucky day. I said, well, first of all, luck had nothing to do with it, son. You know, I'm trying to teach this stuff. I'm like, dude, we got to have breakfast and play cards together because the way his day so he said, you know, I missed the early flight. But you got on the next one. This was not an unlucky day. It's all how you look at it. And one of the things I'm trying to teach my son, and we need to understand because we can do this so quickly, is the glass half full? Really? Man, you got something in the glass. Praise the Lord. Have a thankful heart. I'm like, hey, you missed the first flight, but we got extra time together. And... You got on the next flight. You're calling me from Colorado. Man, I can complain about my times or I can live with a thankful heart. I can say my times are in your hands, Lord. Today's not a bad day. Today is a day that you ordained for me. Isn't that what the psalmist says? Psalm 139, 16, in your book were all written for me. The days that were ordained when not, when it's yet not one of them. I mean, this is how God, he, He gave us these days. Look at it this way. When we complain about a bad day. We're saying, Lord, that one really stunk. Could you take that bat and give me a better one tomorrow? You clearly didn't know what you were doing. No such thing as an unlucky day when you walk in the hand of Jesus Christ. No such thing. Every day is there for a reason. Every day there is purpose behind even the most difficult of struggles. And every day we can lay our heads in the pillow and say, God, thank you for today. Even if it was a tough one. Thank you. My times are in your hands, O Lord. Verse 16, make your face to shine upon your servant. Save me in your loving kindness. Let me not be put to shame, O Lord, for I call upon you. Let the wicked be put to shame. I like that. I'm with you, David. Let the wicked be put to shame. Let them be silent in Sheol. (laughs) Let them be quiet in their death. Let the wicked be silent in hell, he could say. I love this. We were having dinner the other night at the Hoffman home, and Aubrey Hoffman was there. And she was telling about some interactions she'd had with some friends at school. And she said, you know, I tell my friends, this little Aubrey, and if you know Aubrey, you know, she's just, she's just like a little ball of energy. And she said, I've been having, talking, talking with some of my friends, and I, I tell them, I believe in heaven, like most people, but unlike most people, I also believe in hell. And that's why I tell you about Jesus. I mean, that's bold. She's in high school, and this is what she's saying to her friends. I believe in hell, so I'm going to tell you about Jesus, because I don't want you to go there. God bless her. She's telling the truth. And people will listen because of it. There is a wonderful truth there. If there's only a heaven, then not only is there no justice, but there's no reason to share the gospel, right? But if there's also a hell, then we have both justice and and impetus to share the gospel. If there's a hell, then we have our motivation right there to share the gospel. Well, that sounds like fire insurance. Whatever. I'll tell you what. I I really don't care. Whatever we need to use for the sake of the gospel, man, use it. Barring sin, lies, and deceit. But if you need to share the reality of hell with someone, Sheol, where the wicked go, then do it. And share with them the counter to that which is the brilliant grace of God. 
that is it's, it's overwhelming. People need to hear it. Verse 18, Let the lying lips be mute, when, which speak arrogantly against the righteous with pride and contempt. By the way, notice in all the Psalms, David never names anybody. There are times where we almost know that he's talking about Saul, never names him. Here's a hint in an earlier Psalm. He never names them. He never points out names of people who are his enemies and who are wicked, who are slandering him. He never says their names to the Father. He just talks about the situation. He talks about the attitudes, the behavior. He prays against that. We can learn from that. Pray against the behavior. Pray against the bad heart. Don't pray against the person. The person needs Jesus. How great is your goodness, he says in verse 19, which you stored up for those who fear you, which you have wrought for those who who take refuge in you before the sons of men. You hide them in a secret place of your presence from the conspiracies of man. You keep them secretly in a shelter from the strife of tongues. That word shelter, I like this, is literally pavilion. It's pavilion. A pavilion of the Lord for those who trust Him. A covering, a protection, so you don't have to take all the heat for what's being said about you. A good place to be. Verse 21. Blessed be the Lord, for He has made marvelous His loving kindness to me in a besieged city. Probably Ke'ilah. As for me, I said in my alarm, I am cut off from before your eyes. Nevertheless, you heard the voice of my supplications when I cried to you, Oh, love the Lord, all you His godly ones. The Lord preserves the faithful and fully recompenses The proud doer, be strong and let your heart take courage, all you who hope in the Lord or wait expectantly in the Lord. It's a wonderful psalm. David's saying there, there's beauty in a life preserved. What do you mean there's beauty in a life preserved? Let me ask you, whose words would have a greater spiritual impact on you? The words of the proud or the words of the preserved? The words of the self-righteous or the words of the saved? It's an obvious answer. 2 Corinthians 4, 7 says we have this treasure in earthen vessels so that, so that, so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not from ourselves. Paul says we're afflicted in every way, but we're not crushed. We're perplexed, not despairing. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying around in the body the dying of Jesus. So that, so that, the life of Jesus may be manifested also in our body. That's the reason God allows His children to fall on hard times. That's the reason God allows us to struggle and strain and have hardship and strife and toil and difficulty in our lives. Why? Because it glorifies Him. Because the preservation of our lives honors Him, brings glory to Him, lifts Him up. Look back at verse 16, where David writes, Make your face to shine upon your servants. Save me in what? In your loving kindness. Why? That that your loving kindness would be seen for what it is. Why would God save such a prideful, selfish man as Rick Crawford? Honestly. Why would he go out of his way to save me? (laughs) Because my preservation proves his grace. My salvation shows his goodness. Someone looks at me and says, Rick got saved? God must be good. I picked myself out of all of you. I could have picked one or two of you. And so someone might say, well, all right, so you're telling me even your salvation is about Jesus? Yes, it is. And I have no problem with that. Because in the meantime, I get to be saved. All right? Yes, it glorifies God, and and I'm saved. So two good things happening there. But the greater reason, it is always, it is always the greater reason, and that is the glorification of God. That's the whole reason for the salvation of man. It glorifies God. It's the reason for our existence, to glorify God. It's why the angels were created, to glorify God. It's why God made such a beautiful earth, to glorify God. All the good and perfect gifts that are from above, coming down from the Father of lights, as James tells us, are to glorify God. 
Because they all reveal His nature. They all show us His love. David understood that. Well, if salvation of my life glorifies God, then should I set it up to proclaim His grace? <laughs> you know the verse. Paul said in Romans 6.1, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into His death? Therefore, we've been buried with Him through baptism into death so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father. you hear that? Through the glory of the Father. So we too might walk in newness of life. Let me spin around your theology one more time. Do you realize that even the crucifixion of Jesus was more about the glory of the Father than it was about saving you? It saves you. His death saves us. Absolutely. His sacrifice is our salvation. But even that brings glory to the Father. By the way, That's the real story of Psalm 31. That's the real essence of this psalm. Remember, David, like the prophets of old, all were hearing by the Spirit of Christ. And Psalm 31, the psalm of the betrayed, is spoken by the Spirit of Christ. Gang, this psalm, like Psalm 22 before, this psalm is the cry of Christ from the cross. And you can hear it and you can look at it. No one in all history was betrayed like Jesus was betrayed. Maybe you caught this verse, verse 5. Into your hand I commit my spirit. Jesus, last words on the cross. His last sentence, his final word was, it is finished. Or one word in the Greek, finished. Complete. But right before that, and Luke's the one who tells us this, Luke 23, 46, Jesus crying out with a loud voice said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Psalm 31, 5. Having said that, he breathed his last. Don't tell me Jesus didn't know scripture. <laughs> the very last words out of his mouth were a quotation from this particular psalm. And as with Psalm 22, the the psalm of the cross, Jesus cried out from the cross and he directs our attention to Psalm 31 as well. Psalm 22 highlighted the actual physical crucifixion. And we went through that line by line. You see the physicality of the brutality of Jesus' death on the cross prophesied a thousand years early. But in Psalm 31, it's not the physical nature, it's the emotional pain that Jesus went through, that he felt on the cross at Calvary. Jesus' betrayal was different than anybody else's, different than David's, because Jesus saw it coming. David didn't. It wasn't until after he had rescued the people of Calilah that he then goes to the Lord and says, are they going to betray me? And the Lord says, yes. What? I wouldn't have saved him if I had known that. Jesus did know it and saved us anyway. He knew ahead of time. He knew his betrayal was imminent. In John chapter 6, verse 70. This is back early on in his ministry. Jesus said, Did I myself not choose you, the twelve? And one of you is a devil. Jesus chose Judas knowing Judas was the betrayer. Knowing Judas was going to go around behind his back. Knowing Judas was the man who was going to take word to the leaders who would then come and arrest and have Jesus crucified. He knew that. It was not a surprise to him. It wasn't an accidental choice. Well, Jesus was, you know, a pretty good character choice 11 out of 12 times. He knew exactly what he was doing. David didn't know he would be betrayed. Jesus knew. Look at verse 12 of Psalm 31. I am forgotten as a dead man out of mind. I'm like a broken vessel. I have heard the slander of many. Terror is on every side. While they took counsel together against me, they schemed to take away my life. Spirit of Christ to speak in those words. It's exactly what happened. Lies, slanders, schemes, terror on every side, as the Christ cries out. Ah, but listen, verse 14, but as for me, I trust in you, O Lord. I say, You are my God. And this is one of those divine wonders. Jesus, being God in the flesh, still cried out to God his Father still submitted himself completely, emptied himself, Paul says in Philippians 2, and made himself as a man. 
put himself in the relationship of a man to God. Though he himself was God, he cries out to his God. He trusts in God all the way to the cross and through to the grave. Jesus did that because he showed us this incredible trust in God. My times are in your hands. Oh, Jesus knew that. Jesus always knew the time. He knew the time perfectly. John chapter 2, verse 4. At the beginning of his ministry, Jesus knew the time. He was in Cana of Galilee. And you remember Mary came to him and said, Hey, they don't have enough wine. Can you do something? John chapter 2, verse 4. Woman, what does this have to do with us? My hour has not yet come. He knew the time. John chapter 7, verse 6. At the end of his second year, his brothers are pushing Jesus, saying, Come on down to Jerusalem with us. Let's go to the Feast of Booths together. Jesus responds. He says, My time is not yet here. Your time is always opportune. Go. Have fun. But it's not my time. We're told in verse 30 of John chapter 7, they were seeking to seize him, and no, one, no man laid his hand on him because his hour had not yet come. Jesus was here for a reason. I love this. Luke chapter 9, verse 51. This is now the end of three years of ministry. And it says, when the days were approaching for his ascension, he was determined to go to Jerusalem. The word determined is literally he set his face like flint. He said, I am going now. Now's the time. Because Jesus knew the time. John 12, 27, on his last night, he said, My soul has become troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No. For this purpose I came to this hour. Jesus knew. My times are in your hands. He knew the time. And in John 13, verse 1, it tells us before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, that he would depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Psalm 31, my friends, is not looking at the trust of David in God as much as it is looking at the trust of Christ in God, knowing his times were in the hands of the Father. Look at verse 22. As for me, I said in my alarm, I'm cut off from before your eyes. Ah, I'm cut off, he says. The angel Gabriel told Daniel, after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the Lord said this through Isaiah. Isaiah 53, verse 8. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation who considered that he was cut off. Out of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people, to whom the stroke was due. And so just as David writes in the psalm, I'm cut off, so Jesus was cut off. And I believe once again we are hearing the cry of the Spirit of Christ, speaking in his pain and his emotion a thousand years earlier to David, that it might be written down and drawn out when he's on the cross. Again, he draws us to it, saying, into your hand I commit my spirit. He's saying, people, people, pay attention. You want to know how it felt, what I was thinking, what I was feeling, what mattered to me on the cross? Go to Psalm 31. Go there. These are my emotions. Well, yeah, the pastor, verse 22, does say I'm cut off from before your eyes. But it also says, nevertheless, you heard the voice of my supplications when I cried to you. Exactly. Hebrews 5, 7 tells us in the days of his flesh, he offered up both prayers and supplications with loud crying and tears to the one able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his piety. Ironically, David was heard because of Jesus' piety as well. The prayers of David find the vehicle to God by the righteousness of Jesus. David's faith, like Abraham before him. Paul said Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness. Same with David. Same with all those who came before Jesus. Their faith was given as a credit. Believe in me now, and when Jesus comes, he will purchase that faith. He will purchase your righteousness for you. Which is why David was able to have the relationship with God he had. Because of Jesus, who would come a thousand years later. Incredible. Amazing. Jesus, perfect, precious, pious. And he was betrayed. He was betrayed by Judas' kiss. He was betrayed as the people. In one week, in one week, they went from Hosanna to crucify him. Betrayal. 
Jesus was betrayed by His own people, the Jewish leaders who rejected Him. Jesus was betrayed by the apostles who ran away from Him on that night. Jesus was betrayed by the sin of all the world, by you and by me. And He knew He was going to be betrayed and chose to go to the cross anyway. It's because of His piousness, His righteousness, that the prayers of those who believe are heard. Ah, there's, there's just so much here. I mean, you can just track through this. Look at all these different things. Oh, I have a problem here. Wait a minute. Hey, he says, my life is spent with sorrow and my years with sighing. Well, Jesus was a man of sorrows, but, but he says, my strength has failed because of my iniquity. Well, that can't be Jesus because he didn't have sin. Yes, he did on the cross. <laughs> can you hear Jesus on the cross? bearing the weight of the sin of the world and His strength is failing because of the iniquity, the sin, the transgression, the evil of the world on Him at that time on the cross. You better believe He was failing because of the sin of man on Him. My body is wasted away. You can go line for line through Psalm 31 and track the heart of Jesus breaking at His betrayal there on the cross of Calvary. And I encourage you to do that. Go back, read through this, think through the whole thing. In fact, let that be your homework this week if you'd like some. Take each line of this and consider Jesus on the cross. What are you saying? How are you speaking? How is your heart breaking in that place? But there's one last thing I want to share with you tonight. Remember that David's routing of the enemy in 1 Samuel 23... Even when his own people were set to betray him, he he routed the enemy, and there were two results, which are the same two results of Jesus going to the cross. What were those? David led away livestock. Jesus led away livestock from the cross. Who? Sheep? Us? You and me. He led away livestock. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, He Himself bore our sins in His body on the cross, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by His wounds you were healed. For you, all of us, you were continually straying like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. Jesus led away livestock from the cross. Second, He lessened the strength of the enemy on the cross. And don't you miss this. Colossians 2.14 Jesus, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, He has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. When He disarmed the rulers and the authorities... He made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. The Philistines were weakened after David's raid against them, after the great slaughter. They did not have the power they had before. Satan and his demonic horde does not have the power that he had before the cross. Because Jesus lessened the power, the strength of the enemy. Even as the net of, of death seemed to encompass Jesus... He spoke these words of absolute trust in the Father. What was Jesus thinking on the cross? Psalm 22. Psalm 31. Why did the Lord tell David to deliver Keilah, knowing that the people there would betray him? He knew it would cause trouble for David. He knew this. Why would he do that? Because that's what God does. The people needed to be saved. And so even though a betrayal was imminent, God said, I want you to save the people. Because the people need to be saved. Regardless of the outcome, the people need to be saved. Same with Jesus. A psalm needed to be written. Had David not fought the Philistines, Psalm 31 might never have been penned. Certainly not the way we have it before us. And the Lord intended that psalm to get written so that we, even here today, could look back and see the magnificence of the plan and purpose and word of God. A prophetic word that would be spoken by the Spirit of Christ. I believe the Spirit of Christ, through this psalm and through the cross, has a message for you tonight. A message for us. A very specific word that Jesus would say to you 
this evening. And it's verse 24. Be strong and let your heart take courage, all you who wait or hope in the Lord. Father, may we not fear the betrayals and the reprisals of man. May we, like Jesus, simply commit our way to You. May we, Lord, speak words such as Jesus. Into Your hand I commit my spirit. Into Your hand. This night, Jesus, we commit our spirits. Our times are in Your hands. Our lives belong to You. May we live for Your glory. And may we be found by You serving for Your name's sake. God, we praise You. In Jesus' name, Amen.